I've travelled one stop down the Tanfield Railway to find out how this small colliery line became part of the modern railway network. Anthony, they, they call it the world's oldest railway. What were its origins? This begins in 1725 as the Causey Wagonway. Wooden rails and wooden sleepers and horses. It wouldn't be a sleepy, bucolic byway. It would be an artery of industry. How soon before it was converted to steel rails for a proper steam railway? Well, the railway's converted in the 1830s. It becomes part of a network and part of the mania that's sweeping Britain throughout the 19th century. Is there any uh, single figure that stands out in yeah. this great expansion of the railway? If you're talking about railways, we have to talk about George Hudson of York, the railway king, as he became styled through the 1840s. And Hudson really came from nowhere. He's got no great background as such, but 1827, he is left £30,000 by his great uncle. Now, £30,000 in 1827 is about three and a half million pounds in today's money, and he buys his way into the establishment, as it were. And amongst the things he bought was this railway. Yeah. After successfully investing in the railway linking London to York, Hudson decided to push further north and build a line from London to Gateshead. To do this, he bought up this stretch of railway transforming it into a major rail link. In the year 1846 alone, 272 applications were put forward for new railway lines in Britain. As rail shares rocketed, vast fortunes were made and celebrities created. Hudson had gone from being a nobody to having audiences with the Queen, but behind his meteoric rise was a darker story. He had his own money, but even so, how could he have afforded this? It's where a little bit of sharp practice came in, and this was the beginning of Hudson's downfall, really. He was found that he was falsifying accounts, he was selling land that wasn't his to sell. So, uh, was Hudson a crook? Yes. He spends a bit of time in debtor's prison, but friends rally round and bail him out, but you know, he dies a broken man in 1871. What does the rise and fall of George Hudson and the whole railway mania that you've mm. described, what does that tell us about the Victorians? What the railway mania tells us is there was an appetite for everywhere to be connected. It's unifying the country in a way that nothing else can do. And the incredible thing is that the railway age really starts in the northeast here. In 1830, George Stevenson opened his first intercity railway, linking the two major hubs of Britain's textile industry, Liverpool and Manchester. And as job opportunities increased, the railway provided transport for over a 1,000 passengers a day. When new lines were opened a few years later, linking Liverpool directly to London, the port of Liverpool became the West Coast gateway for trade between Britain and America. It was a coup for Liverpool, but it was a disaster for their biggest rivals at the time, Bristol. The two cities were in head-to-head -head competition for the lucrative American trade routes. The new railway line put Liverpool way ahead of the curve. The Bristolians demanded their own railway line through to London, Victoria's great capital city, to keep Bristol and its port afloat. So in 1838, the Great Western Railway opened and began building lines towards the capital. The railway was constructed by none other than Isambard Kingdom Brunel. One of the greatest civil engineers in British history, Brunel was famed for his cutting-edge ship design, revolutionary tunnelling techniques and awe-inspiring bridges. How did he set about it? Did he just see what Stevenson and the others were doing up in the north and copy them? He went up north and travelled on the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, but he decided his railway would be his own creation and it wouldn't be a carbon copy of railways like the Liverpool and Manchester. So he decided he would build a complete railway system of his own. In what way was it different? The main one, of course, is the track gauge. It would be built to seven feet and a quarter of an inch. The gauge, or width, of the tracks can be seen here at the Didcot Railway Centre on the Great Western Railway. 
At seven feet and a quarter of an inch, Brunel's gauge was over two feet wider than the standard gauge. What did he see as the advantage of having a wider gauge to the tracks? There would be smoother running, the carriages were larger, that you could carry more passengers. He saw it as a really um, groundbreaking uh, railway that would take railway development forward. And did it turn out that way? Was the Great Western Railway quicker, more comfortable than the others? Initially, yes, it was, and it had a reputation for being a rather stately way of travelling. <laughs> um, but, of course, they had the very knotty problem of what were called breaks of gauge, where the two types of railways met. One station where the two types of gauges clashed was Gloucester. Here, even the Queen was forced to get off one gauge train onto another to continue her journey. So you had Brunel's Great Western Railway running on these wide tracks. You had all the rest in the north on narrower tracks. How was this resolved? What became known as the Gage War in the mid-1840s was only really addressed by a royal commission in 1845. They took evidence from all the engineers of the time, including Brunel and Stevenson, um, to get an idea of what should be the track gauge for the whole of the United Kingdom. Did the Commission come to any conclusions about which was better? Ultimately, the Commission had to look at it from a practical point of view. By the time the Gauge Commission reported, there were about 1,900 miles of what we call standard gauge, four foot eight and a half, and only 274 miles of broad gauge at that point. So Brunel's idea, and Brunel himself, I suppose, lost out. It did, but of course Brunel was unrepentant when he was asked, if you were going to build it now, what would you do? And he said, I might be being accused of being reckless, but I'd build it even wider. <laughs> Between them, the telegraph system and the Great Western Railway changed the very nature of time. Before then, there was no such thing as standard time across Britain. Each town set their own, mainly on the basis of where the sun was, which meant that everywhere west of London was behind Greenwich Mean Time. So if it was midday in London, it would be 11.56 in Oxford, 11.50 in Bristol and 11.40 in North Wales. But when the railways came along, all that changed. Once trains could cross the entire country in a day, they had to draw up timetables. And this was impossible if the clocks in every town told a different time. So, in 1840, the Great Western Company announced that all its stations would operate on a standard time, what they called railway time. In some cities, like Bristol, the clocks had two sets of hands, one telling local time, and the other railway time dictated by Greenwich. Eventually, in 1880, the government declared a single standard time zone. It wasn't just the telegraph that revolutionized communication. Trains themselves brought about a radical change in the way people kept in touch with each other. I've come to the National Railway Museum in New York to find out more about how the railways revolutionised our postal service. When did they first start carrying the post on the railways? Mail is carried on the railways from the beginning of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway in 1830. Within days of the railway opening, the post office is having to negotiate terms with the railway to carry the mail because the, the mail coaches just can't keep up. So right at the start? Absolutely. The whole thing with carrying mail by rail is it gives you speed. It gives you the ability to distribute across the country. You can post something at 7 o'clock in the evening and by breakfast time it's with the person that you want in Glasgow. To ensure the speediest of deliveries, the fastest trains on each line were selected and travel was barred to ordinary passengers except those willing to pay a premium. How did these trains actually pick up the post? You need to do it on the move, and this net is hung out the side of the carriage. It folds down and it catches bags of mail that were hung up by the side of the track. It scoops up the bags as the train goes past and the speed of the train throws them through the open door at the side of the carriage, where the staff, the sorting teams, then open the bags and begin to sort the mail. 
It's ingenious. It's cracking. <laughs> and it worked. Absolutely. And this system worked from the 1830s until 1971. Good gracious. Which is amazing. Yeah.